Hello and welcome. I hope you're doing well. Come and get cozy as I share with you some absolutely terrifying encounters. I post new videos every day, so be sure to hit that subscribe button and the notification bell, and you'll be notified when new daily content arrives on my channel. All right, let's get right into it. Near Salina in Sevier County in Utah, I was in the Fish Lake National Forest hunting with my wife and newborn daughter. I also had three friends with me, but they were in a separate vehicle pulling a trailer. We were archery elk hunting. We pulled off the main road and went on a dirt road as far as we could until we came to a small group of trees. And so we pulled into these trees and set up camp. My friends found a spot about a hundred feet from my camper and set up there. It wasn't a very level area, so I found some big rocks and drove my truck up on it to level it out. We spent a couple of days there and nothing unusual happened. The last night we were there at around 1.30 a.m. in the morning, my wife and I woke up by something hitting the side of my camper. My truck was a full-sized truck and I had an 11-foot camper. The hit on the side of my camper was so hard it's hard to explain. My wife and I were both immediately awake. Like I said, the hit was so hard that my first thought was that the truck had slipped off the rocks that I had used to level it. Anyone that has done that before can imagine how much force that would take to rock your vehicle to have you slip off the rocks all of a sudden. The camper actually rocked back and forth about six inches. My daughter remained asleep, however. My black lab that is usually ready to bark at any noise outside was shaking in her bed. I tried to get her up on the floor of the camper and she would have nothing to do with that. She just sat there and shook. I got up and stood up in the camper, wondering if I should go outside and see what had happened, not knowing what had happened. I really wasn't afraid or anything. I peeked out of the blinds and couldn't see anything. There was a storm in the distance and the lightning was getting close. As I watched outside, there was a flash of lightning and it lit up the immediate area around my camper. All I saw was the long grass around the camper, nothing unusual. After about 20 minutes, I returned to bed and got under the covers. My wife and I talked for a few minutes about what we thought it was we thought of everything from a tree branch falling and hitting the camper to a bear hitting it. We just didn't know. Just as I'm about to sleep again, bam, another hit on the side of the camper. Same place, but a lot harder this time. It rocked the camper so hard that the doors under the sink actually came open and the pans slid out on the floor, making a bunch of noise. I was wide awake and standing up before I knew it. Something was outside. This happened years ago, and as I'm writing this, I have goosebumps on my arms. I have never been so scared in my life. My dog was shaking like crazy. My wife wasn't going to get out of bed. I made sure the door was locked. Since we were archery hunting, you can't have any firearms, so all I had was a knife. The blinds were shut, and I was too afraid to look out. My wife kept saying, look outside or look out the emergency exit. No way. Like I said, I have never been so afraid in my life. To this day, I think that not looking out was one of the biggest mistakes that I have ever made. I would give anything to have that chance back. Nothing else happened the rest of the night. When we awoke in the morning, I was very cautious and opened the door. The sun was just barely cracking to the east and the sky was dark blue. I opened up the door and looked at the ground. The grass around the camper was trampled down, but that could have been from us the day before. There were no tree limbs lying next to the camper. As a matter of fact, as I looked at where the trees actually were, it would have been impossible for a limb to fall and hit us. There were no rocks or anything lying around the truck. Then I looked up at my camper. There, on the side of my camper, was a huge dent. 
I'm six feet tall and the dent was so high on my camper that if I stood next to the camper and tried to touch the dent, I almost had to jump to reach it. This wasn't an ordinary dent. It was about eight inches in diameter and about three inches deep. It actually dented the aluminum and broke the wood underneath, causing $400 in damage. I went over to my friend's trailer and knocked on the door. They opened the door and the first thing out of their mouth was, what were you doing walking around our trailer last night? I told them what had happened and that whatever was walking around their trailer wasn't me. He said he heard me slam my door during the night. I told him that I hadn't opened my door and that the noise he heard was something hitting my camper. I've known these friends for many, many years and I trust them completely. I've had people say that it was my friends playing a joke on me. They completely deny that, and I do trust them. And why would you ever play a joke on a friend by damaging his camper and pounding on the side of his camper while his infant daughter and wife are asleep inside? I consider myself a sane person. I've hunted bears in Montana for a long time. I've killed several bears. I know how big and powerful bears are, and for that reason, I have to say there are bears in the area we were camping. Not many, but some. In my opinion, there is no way that a black bear could reach that high on my camper that the dent was, and then hit my camper in the exact spot 30 minutes apart. There just isn't any way that this was a bear. I know that bears are strong, but to hit my camper with so much force would be impossible for a black bear. We were parked in the tall grass off the main road. In the morning, we checked around the camper and only found smashed grass, which could have been from us from the previous day. It all happened at around 1.30 a.m. I know there had been a sighting within 30 miles of here a few years ago, but I didn't know that until looking for Bigfoot encounters online. On to the next one. Near Fairview in Emory County in Utah, it is a two-hour truck drive, a three-hour horse ride, and a one-hour hike to get to our elk spot. About half an hour before sunup, two of us were elk hunting in James Canyon near Fairview, Utah. We heard a scream from across the canyon, which repeated every few seconds for five or six episodes. It shook the forest. I have spent my whole life in the woods all over the West, and I know there is no animal in America that sounds that loud and piercing. Ten years later, it dawned on me that what we had been privileged to hear, my hunting buddy agrees, and we heard a similar recording on a Bigfoot website. It sounded like a mix between a baby crying, a mountain lion roaring, and a bull snorting. Since then, I've talked to three friends that have had eyewitness accounts, one of them gave me a cutout of a footprint they found near their ranch in Idaho. It is huge, and there were three sets of prints all different sizes. A university in Boise came and did plaster casts. Those that have seen are normal in every way. After the second scream, we got behind the trees and loaded our rifles. Also, after the screams, we never saw another critter all day, where there were lots of elk and deer the day before. I wish we would have thought of Bigfoot at the time and looked for prints. Both of us were sitting on the hillside observing some openings across the canyon where we usually spotted elk grazing. The elevation was about 8,000 to 9,000 feet, very steep, and well-timbered, small stream and canyon, fir, spruce, and dogwood brush. A man and his family saw a solo Bigfoot in the same area. On to the next one. The Chupcan. They are original inhabitants of the area that is now Contra Costa County in Northern California. They lived along the streams in Concord, which flowed north to the wide true marshes on the edge of the bay and into Pittsburgh and Black Diamond Mine areas. The Chupcan are a separate Bay Area division of the Miwok tribe. Mount Diablo, located near the San Francisco Bay Area in Northern California, approximately 3,849 feet at its highest point, 
also plays a key role in part of the core of their beliefs. Figures in their legends and myth the Chupkin had believed this world began at Mount Diablo following a flood. They had also believed in animal and human spirits and saw the animal spirits as their ancestors. There is yet another interesting piece of historical information in the What's a Name placard at the very top of Mount Diablo, located in Mount Diablo State Park in Northern California. The placard tells the story of how long ago the area where the Spanish had once designated for the Chepkin people to live was later referred to by the Spanish as Monte del Diablo, or in English, Thickets of the Devil. The Spanish gave the Chapcan village the name Monte del Diablo when they were attempting to round up what the placards described as runaway mission Indians. In the year of 1804 or 1805, these Native Americans, according to the placard, had escaped from the village assigned to them by the Spanish. The Chapcan village was not the mountain which now bears the name Diablo or Devil in English but present-day Buchanan Field nearby. English-speaking visitors had mistaken the name Mont to mean mountain, and that is one way in which Mount Diablo was given its name. However, another telling of how Mount Diablo was given that name is also referred to on the same placard. The second story relates how, in 1850, General Mariano Vallejo and the Spanish were routed around the foot of the same mountain when they had seen what the placard quoted as an unknown personage or evil spirit. The placard describes the following. General Mariano Vallejo's account was somewhat different. In an 1850 version, Vallejo placed the incident at the foot of Mount Diablo, claiming that the Spanish were routed when an unknown personage or evil spirit appeared. In 1914, Vallejo's son Platon made his father the hero who lassoed this agent of the master, the devil. Interesting how the placard clears up the first story of how the mountain was really named by a general's account. The naming of Mount Diablo by the Spanish after such an encounter is much similar to many places named by the Native American as the devil or spirit named places where Bigfoot or Sasquatch history seems to be retold in stories relative to the naming of whatever location. The story described by Spanish is also a cross-cultural account, being that this account of a devil-named place was not of Native American origin. It was the Spanish who had later given this mountain its new name, Mount Diablo, after what some of them had claimed to have seen. The story also sheds light on many of the devil, spirit, and skookum named places by Native Americans in North America. This proves that it was not only the Native Americans who had given their location names based on their observation of these man-like animals, but those who are of other races and other cultures as well. In this case, the observation is made by the Spanish in an area where the Chupkan had also made similar observations in the past. This gives credence to the idea of certain devil, spirit, and skookum named places having been named based on actual observations by Native Americans. Much like the Spanish, who in this case had named Mount Diablo based on much similar observations on what seems to be the same described animal, person, or monster. It seems just like the Spanish naming Mount Diablo as being associated with what the Spanish describe as an unknown personage or evil spirit, that the Native Americans had also named many places after what they had referred to as devils, spirits, or skookum. This is based on what we may now come to know not as a devil or a spirit, but the actual existence of a real animal. This is more suggestive of being a primate, if anything else. Mount Diablo may seem to be yet another example as having somehow been a place named and identified from an actual Bigfoot or Sasquatch encounter, this time by the Spanish. The part about Vallejo's son having made his father the hero in a 1914 story that he had made up is obviously false. However, 
the description of what his father had described in 1850 at the foot of Mount Diablo most likely has its basis in truth. This story also introduces and identifies the same concept and pattern as the Native American legends and stories which pertain to what we now know of today as Bigfoot or Sasquatch. The description of this creature is very much the same or similar from tribe to tribe, yet we also know many of the stories that are made up or exaggerated upon to enhance some of the details given to this great creature also fits within a fictitious narrative, as do some of the different stories told among various tribes as having actually defeated this giant altogether. Much similar to the story that was added by General Valero's son, here we can see the same pattern in the story and the addition added later by his son. In either case, these stories are still held as significant. Perhaps Native American stories based on actual encounters change into fictitious negative accounts over time. In fact, the photo of large stone inscribed petroglyphs of a very large muscular humanoid creature bearing no discernible neck, which in its crouched position is almost as wide as it is tall, was found on Mount Diablo inscribed in stone. The petroglyph in fact probably represents the same thing which General Mariano Vallejo had also described and had more than likely been placed there in stone as a reminder by the Chupcan First Nations long before Mount Diablo was ever given its name. Approximately 20 years after the Spanish account, there was another mention of a being fitting the same description as the figure which is rendered in stone on the petroglyph of Mount Diablo. This was mentioned from an article in the Tootsville, Pennsylvania Morning Herald dated November 10th, 1870. The article mentions a man's encounter with one of these similarly described creatures due south, yet on the same range of the Diablo Mountains. From the article, the description of the animal given is as follows. Disproportionately broad and square at the shoulders, with arms of great length, the legs were very short and the body long. The head was small compared to the rest of the creature and appeared to be set upon the shoulders without a neck. How is it that the description also describes what is inscribed in stone on the rocks of Mount Diablo? The newspaper description describes the ancient petroglyph better than it does the description that General Vallejo had given just 20 years prior. The name Chetco translates to close to the mouth of the stream. The Chetco tribe was originally settled from the mouth of the Pacific Ocean to about 14 miles inland along the banks of the Chetco River in southern Oregon. An incident had occurred during the 1890s along the Chetco River on the California-Oregon border. During a logging operation, no less, one logger had mentioned to the rest of his crew at the time that some of the area's local Chetco tribesmen actually had stories of giant hairy man-like beasts. According to what he had told some of his fellow workers, the creature described would occasionally leave behind big man-like footprints. The Chetco Native Americans believed there were man-like animals in the woods. The logger informed his friends. He had heard the story from a white man whom the Native Americans trusted enough to take into their confidence. They claimed that for generations they had shared their hunting grounds with fierce-looking hairy creatures who walked upright like men. The strange beings were not human nor animal, neither friendly nor hostile. They were simply there, like every other man or wild creature, so the natives left them alone. As the story goes, the men in the camp had decided more than once to try to pursue and kill the creature in question. The last attempt ended with the tragic result. The final attempt at killing this Bigfoot or Sasquatch-like creature had ended tragically when a party of men was heard by others from the camp to be screaming all at once as shots were fired multiple times and the creature vocalized horrendous shrieks and roars. This was suddenly brought to a crashing halt by an incredible silence and stillness which filled the air and seemed to bring about a morbid fear 
among those who were further back away from the violence and still left unscathed in the ensuing party, Bigfoot. Before long, they came upon a gruesome sight. Their friends were dead. Judging from bloodstains, their bodies had been slammed against tree trunks and torn to pieces. A trail of blood-smeared footprints led off into the forest. The beast obviously had been wounded, but no man present was willing to track it through the dark forest. Some did volunteer to gather up the remains of their unfortunate comrades, while others returned to camp for blankets and to break the sad news. If you have an encounter you would like to share, you can reach me by submitting it to the email in the description box down below. Also, if you'd like to send in a physical letter of your encounter or any fan mail, I also have a P.O. box, which you can find in the description box down below. I love just hearing from all of you, so those options are available if you ever feel like reaching me. I hope you enjoyed those encounters. And if you did, be sure to hit that like button, leave a comment, and subscribe. I post new content every single day, so be sure to hit that notification bell, and you'll be notified exactly when that new content arrives on my channel. Again, thank you so much, and until next time, bye!